met a plantation here in Kuang, Malaysia, owned by IOI Corporation, one of the biggest crude palm oil producers in the world. IOI Group founder, the late Li Xin Cheng, planted the seeds of what would become the palm oil giant. IOI Corporation, when he acquired three palm estates in Pahang, Malaysia, in 1983. The entrepreneur was a self-made man and he was fondly nicknamed the Tree Whisperer because of his affinity with palm oil trees. Today, his son, Li Yao Cho, runs the corporation and under his leadership, employs 28,000 people, operates 100 palm oil fields and 15 mills in both Malaysia and Indonesia. Together with IOI Properties, IOI Corporation forms the IOI Group, which is today one of Malaysia's biggest conglomerates. I met up with Li Yao Cho to discuss a number of issues, such as digitalization and sustainable practices. But first, I asked him what it was like to grow up in the family business. Uh, from very early age on, my father already exposed me to the palm oil plantations and the property construction. Mm -hmm. So during holidays, uh, he would bring me to palm oil plantations. We stay a few nights there, and and I get to observe closely mm -hmm. how he uh, go around inspecting the plantations, mm -hmm. and similarly for the construction. Your late father, Tan Shri Doctor. Li Shin Cheng put you officially in charge of IOI Corporation in 2014. Do you remember the day he handed over the reins to you? Yeah, I remember quite clearly. Uh, in fact, there was a uh, sort of a media conference when we invited analysts and some uh, selected media. Mm -hmm. He has been the CEO of the business for probably almost 30 years at that time. Were you ready to take over officially? Yeah. I believe so. Because I really joined the business for uh, uh, about 20 years mm -hmm. uh, at that time. During the question and answer, I was asked a question by the uh, media. Uh, what do I see as the greatest challenge mm -hmm. facing me as, as a CEO? So a bit tongue-in-cheek, I remember I was saying the greatest challenge was uh, trying to persuade the, the former CEO to play his role as a chairman <laughs> and no longer as a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to his credit, I think he uh, tried very hard to not interfere. Yes, to m uh, give me a free rein in running the business. But uh, of course, the major decisions uh, he still uh, make the final call. Mm. And uh, but but uh, he wasn't going to let go so easily, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 2018, under Li Yao Cho. IOI Corp began a digital transformation drive across all of its estates and mills. Grading of its fresh fruit bunches, or FFBs, is now done by a handheld electronic plantation monitoring system. The data helps optimize activities across the group's entire value chain for the over 176,000 hectares of land it oversees. That's around two and a half times the size of Singapore. Can I ask, how much does this whole digitalization process cost? Yeah, of course, uh, it's a continuous cost, but the initial setup, of course, it will be in a range of tens of millions of ringgit. And every year, we would have to spend uh, also quite a large sum towards it. Mm. Uh, over time, also, we improve upon it. For example, now we are moving into the cloud, the cloud-based software. And with cloud-based software, the same system, uh, uh, there's a lot of innovations in, that can be mm. incorporated into it. So speaking of innovations, a lot of talk about AI, IoT, and how it's going to revolutionize the way business is done. Is this something you're implementing across all your operations? Yes, we are looking into it, but uh, we'll do it progressively. Mm -hmm. So for, I think, for plantations being more traditional agricultural mm -hmm. activity, so we cannot be fully embracing the IR 4.0 initiatives like manufacturing. But nevertheless, we have this uh, uh, palm oil mill where it is like a factory. So uh, there we manage, we are now implementing quite a number of called the IR 4.0 initiatives mm -hmm. using IOTs. In the field operations also, we have started using drones 
And in the future, there are plans to use these drones to detect uh, the planting density as well as the disease that, might, that uh, the palms might have. Your upstream business makes up more than half of your plantation profits. How do you navigate the constant volatility surrounding palm oil prices? We are uh, quite integrated in, our, in terms of having a downstream operations. So, for example, when upstream uh, profit is low, uh, the raw material for the downstream, actually, the price uh, is also becomes low and therefore the margin is higher. Of course, the downstream-wise, there's a lot of scope of usage. So we go, mainly we go into two branches. One is food ingredients, the other is oleochemicals. For example, food ingredients, so we can develop into very high value added segments. Uh, for example, infant formula used in infant food. And then for oleochemicals, again, uh, one can go further to very, very high value added uh, applications, such as pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. So this is how we enhance the earnings from the downstream. What are yields like in these two very specialized segments compared to what you normally produce? for consumer staples? So the margins for these applications, I would say uh, when you compare to midstream applications, which is just simple refined products, are uh, many folds. So I would say 30 to even 100 times more per ton. However, of course, the volume is uh, much smaller compared to simple refined palm oil, which is used for cooking oil purposes. Mm. Any firm plans to expand your oleochemical business? Definitely, but uh, we are more looking in terms of more varied, uh, more higher value applications. Such as? In pharmaceuticals, we have still not expanded our range of applications. So, for example, in our plants in Germany, so we are doing a lot of R&D and then we are able to, so far, register 26 patents for our ingredients to be used in pharmaceutical applications. So with this patent, I believe you will secure a very good margin uh, in the days to come. Any plans to acquire oleochemical business in yep. order to expand your business? Sure, we are always looking for uh, these uh, opportunities for acquisition, but mostly in European and American countries where we think the technology is good and uh, already there's a read there's the market access to multinational companies. So our Germany acquisition is one of it, and we are looking at uh, more to come. Mm. You're also making products for the infant nutrition market. How lucrative is this segment? What does future growth look like for the baby formula market? As an indication on the margin, so whatever margin we make for normal food in, in food ingredients, like for products like, say, donuts, so we probably will make about 10 times more in terms of margin uh, when used in the infant applications. Of course, the quality has to be very high and the food safety standard very stringent. You're currently selling your baby formula product to markets in China as well as Europe. Any plans to expand to the US at some stage? US is def yeah, it's a big market because we there's already plans to expand this infant food formula to US. But at the moment, we are strong in China and also fairly established in Europe. What kind of growth does China give you? In the past, it has been, of course, double digit, sometimes 20, even 30 percent per annum. But lately, China also experienced uh, population uh, slowdown, growth slowdown, and therefore the growth rate has been more modest. When you look at crude palm oil prices, they were very volatile last year. Are you expecting prices to stabilize? I believe prime oil price for this year will stabilize uh, at around current levels. But I think more importantly is what is the medium and long term outlook for palm oil. So the market fundamentals for palm oil, I believe, will in the medium and long term remain very positive. Don't go away, coming up. So it was a big crisis that IOI faced at that time. More with the CEO of IOI Corporation, Li Yao Cho, after the break.
Welcome back to Managing Asia. I'm with Li Yao Cho, CEO of Malaysian palm oil producer, IOI Corporation. We are at the R&D Center at one of the estates that looks at improving crop and oil yields. We do a lot of our, uh, research ourselves on seed production, on pest management and fertilizer uh, application. So these are all done internally. So we have four research stations. This is one of them mm -hmm. and two here and two in Sabah. And of course we employ about 50 to R&D uh, plus also, uh, to undertake this ergonomic work. Besides that, we also have our own uh, certified chemical laboratory, mm. which will uh, analyze soil nutrients and folio folio sampling. When I think of palm oil and, and how it's so pervasively used in so many things from say soap, toothpaste, shampoos, chocolates, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, do you ever see a future where we can do away with palm oil altogether? I think the world is going to need more and more of palm oil. Mm. So as it is, palm oil is uh, already the largest uh, produced vegetable oil in the world occupying about 30% of the total global production. So with the growing population and the limited supply availability because of climate change and, and the limited agrarian land. So the challenge to meet the demand is going to be, uh, get uh, higher and higher. So in recent years, lots of controversies surrounding the production of palm oil. It's often been linked to deforestation, the destruction of habitats, endangering species. As a business, how do you respond to these environmental concerns? Yeah, we tackle the issue straight on. So when people attack palm oil for being environmentally unfriendly, so in 2015, IOI came up with a strong policy of, we call it in short, NDPE, that means no deforestation, no peat, and no exploitation. So that, uh, I think, uh, is a very firm policy that uh, addresses the environmental sustainability part. But at the same time, we also look at the social sustainability aspect as well. Mm. So for that, I think we emphasize a lot on employee safety and health and uh, we give very good facilities for our workers. And uh, so far in our estates, we have built almost 8,000 houses for our workers throughout our plantations in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, despite your sustainability goals, your SDG goals, in 2016, you came under intense scrutiny by Greenpeace activists who claimed that you drained and planted on peatland designated for restoration in a sustainability commitment. The industry body immediately suspended your sustainability certification, which led to consumer giants like Unilever, Nestle and Mars dropping IOI as a supplier. How did you handle the crisis that suddenly engulfed the company? So it was a big crisis that IOI faced at that time, 2016. We decided to handle the issue straight on from various aspects. So first, as I told you, we came up with a policy, a strong policy, but a strong policy is by itself is not enough. So we put a lot of resources to behind the implementation kind of, of this policy. So we have about more than 100 operating units. So we each of the operating units, we have we'll put in one personnel just to look at sustainability. So instantly we have more than 100 uh, personnel uh, being involved in sustainability already. And then of course, on top of that, at the regional level and at the HQ level, we also added more personnel to look at, to handle various issues on sustainability. At the same time, we also reached out to the NGO and uh, organizations. We engaged in a lot of dialogue. Firstly, we want to understand what they are not happy with. At the same time, we also take the opportunity to explain the complexity behind the issues that they have raised. Mm. So I think we managed to achieve a very good understanding and solution for the issues that they have raised. So actually within about three months, we managed to get the suspension that you talked about lifted from the RS RSPO. 
And then, uh, of course, it took longer with the NGOs, but also within about 18 months. And uh, we managed to find a good solution and they actually stopped their campaign against us. So what were some of the painful lessons learned? Indeed, it was a very painful lesson in terms of not just financially, but also of our reputation. So in the past, because one of our strengths is we don't believe in publicizing a lot of what we say. We prefer to execute and do the things, right? just achieve the results. But that episode, of course, taught us that. You besides, need to be more open and transparent. Yes. And besides doing things well, we must also be able to communicate well. And uh, so in a way, I've learned to be a fairly good communicator now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we become more open to the public. So we publish a lot of uh, statements in our apps, websites. Sometimes not when something's achieved, but even when there is progress and or no progress, we still update the general uh, public or the stakeholders about all the various works that we are undertaking. Mm. How would you describe your relationship today? with NGOs and green movements? I would say we have a fairly good understanding. 2016, it was more on the environmental issues. But several years later, so let's say in 2020, the focus has shifted from environment to social. So therefore, we also done a round of engagement with the NGOs about the social aspect, how we treat the employees or the, our staff suppliers. So these are the journey that we have gone through with the NGOs. Mm. NGOs are not going to go away anytime soon. How do you keep up with the demands and changes of your critics? How big a challenge is it? So we engage, as we say, that the relationship established during the early days. So it keeps on, uh, we keep maintaining it. And we have uh, some projects, collaborative projects with them, sometimes the, the uh, new NGOs as well. So. Through that projects, we develop a very good understanding with them. And of course, we also have to be very aware of various issues that are coming out in the horizon. Of course, and climate change is definitely one of them. And this also we treat it very seriously. Still to come on Managing Asia. No major plantations have undertaken this organic palm oil. So we decided to take the plant. More with Lee Yao Chow, CEO of IOI Corporation, after the break. Welcome back to Managing Asia. I'm with Lee Yao Chaw, CEO of Malaysian palm oil producer, IOI Corporation. And he's showing me an area of the estate that the company has dedicated to growing organic palm. So here in Kluang, Malaysia, you own Malaysia's first organic palm oil plantation. What made you take the organic route? We have a lot of customers in Europe. So I could see that the potential of organic oil is very good. Firstly, it's natural. And of course, uh, in Europe, they, are, they managed to fetch a good premium, uh, about 20 to 30 percent premium compared to the normal palm oil. So, and seeing that Malaysia in Malaysia, there's no one, no major uh, plantations have undertaken this organic palm oil. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take the plant. So there is a market for it. What are the farming processes involved in an organic estate? Yeah, because there's a reason why. Uh, plantation company in Malaysia don't want to undertake this organic farm, uh, oil palm. Uh, that's because it's uh, require a whole re-engineering of the whole production process. Mm -hmm. So basically, organic palm oil means we use zero chemicals. Zero? Zero in the production process. So we have to totally <laughs> re-engineer all this process and just use natural ways to uh, provide nutrients and to uh, for regular maintenance and also to eliminate pests mm. in the plantations. Does that mean consumers pay a higher price for your organic palm oil? Well, Ultimately? Definitely, definitely. Because we are still unable to match the yield of the conventionally grown palm oil. So we are still finding way to improve the yield. And, but we, we think it's still a very worthwhile venture because mm. the premium for this and also the 
our market standing mm -hmm. by being able to offer organic palm oil to our main multinational customers, I think give us a good edge in the market. I'm just curious, what's demand like for organic palm oil? It's still Is quite it growing small. fast? Yes, it's small but fast growing. And because it started with Europe, but it's spread to America now. We have managed to get it certified just recently. And with that uh, as a background, we became confident and uh, we intend to expand this organically produced palm oil by probably double fold. Your father founded the palm oil business. You're the second generation leading the KL listed company. As the founder, what exactly was your father's vision and how are you continuing his legacy? For my father's vision is simply that whatever company, he wants it to be the leading corporations in the segments that we choose to be in. So for as our group consists of our corporation and our properties. So just two, just two main business segments. We make sure we are among in the leading players in those uh, respective business. So you so lead the family's palm oil business. Your younger brother leads the property business. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned from your father about doing business? I think the first thing that always strikes me and also the many others who work closely with him is his hands-on management and his attention to details. And this comes from going on to the ground. So many You're following of, in his footsteps? I hope so. I hope too. Yeah. I would say he spends a lot of time going to, to visit plantations. Sometimes he can go to plantations at one time for seven days, ten days, even two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then to the construction sites, he also go very often. And uh, he actually takes personal attention to, even sometimes you may think it's a very administrative things. For example, he would uh, meet the suppliers or contractors mm -hmm. in the negotiation. Uh, so actually many CEOs don't do that, they leave it, they delegate Is he a good negotiator? And, and he is. Does he strike a good deal? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of his charisma. But I think more importantly is by this direct engagement, he finds out a lot about the industry trends. And also the, he can learn a lot and, and he does extract good advice from suppliers or contractors who will tell him or the cost saving initiatives that can be made. In the tender. How different are you from your father in terms of personal leadership and management style? He's a very outgoing and he, he engages a lot socially. So I would say I'm more an uh, introverted person, not so socially, uh, I would say, uh, friendly. But, uh, but nevertheless, I have uh, make it a point that I want to also, at the same time, to have better engagement with my people who work with me. Stay and uh, so that's one of my goals, is to be a more engaging, inspiring leader in our organisation and hopefully also in the society. Mm. And finally, where do you see the future of the palm oil business? What will IOI Corp look like under your leadership? We have always been recognised as among the most uh, efficient palm oil producers, but we also want to be now a more technologically advanced uh, palm oil producer. And lastly, we look at innovations. Uh, the biomass, the utilization of the biomass, the byproducts is one of them. And uh, we also look at the other innovations, the digitalization to improve our uh, production process and also to come up with new products using agri technology. Mm. For example, the, uh, we are using black soldier fruit flies to convert the empty fruit bunch fiber into organic fertilizer. So hopefully this will come into a commercial utilization soon. So it sounds like IOI is going to be a high-grade technology palm oil company. <laughs> yes, and more importantly, it's the future focused and future ready. I hope. Dato, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. And I've been speaking with Li Yao Cho, CEO of IOI Corporation here in Malaysia. For more interview highlights, do check out managingasia.cnbc.com. I'm Christine Tan. Thanks for watching.